welcome Marshall Kaplan. Marshall, let's start out with an overview of HUD and its ability to meet its own expectations. Good. Let me begin by saying that I began my um, HUD journey um, in 1960 when I was with F when I was with HHFA, the predecessor of HUD, and it was then headed by Dr. Weaver, who was a friend at the time. And uh, as I look over HUD throughout history, I've come to some of the these tentative conclusions. One, HUD had a conflicting set of objectives at the outset. The first one was to build housing. And in effect, it, it, it absorbed, HH, HHFA had F, I'm sorry, HHFA had FHA within it and the Public Housing Authority. They were two strong agencies at the time. Um, and they were a housing agency. So HUD, in effect, encapsulated the housing part of HHFA and added the community development part. So you, in effect, had housing as the dominant part of HUD at the outset, and you had community development as a hope for HUD task, if it could manage it, evolve it, define it. Those two often tasked. FHA was a suburban housing agency at the time, and community development was an urban central city objective. And how HUD managed those two policy initiatives or pegs is the story of HUD, and they are pervasive issues throughout the history of HUD. Now, let me come to my first conclusion. Uh, I look back at the predecessor environment to HUD, and I think HUD may have lost the battle before it started. Let me explain why. The, the effort to desegregate growing ghettos and ultimately barrios began in the 50s. The court, Supreme Court outlawed racial covenants. And in effect, there was a chance to, in effect, integrate the suburbs, have metropolitan areas that reflected not the segregation of the ghettos, but the integration of metropolitan areas. The federal government failed at that task. Not HFA, not HHFA or HUD, but the federal government built circumferential roads, for example, which allowed people in the suburbs to get to work without going into central city. FHA was resistant to opening up its insurance programs to minorities and low-income people. So they were, in effect, impeded in moving out to the suburbs at that point in time. And that there was just racism. And uh, we were trying to integrate schools at the same time, Brown versus Board of Education. And the whole integration effort also created you know, tension in the housing area. And you had all those things happening, and we missed an opportunity. It was a golden opportunity to integrate housing, schools, and we missed it. So, therefore, everything else is sort of part of a history is how do we, do we, in effect, build up and revitalize ghetto areas, or do we provide income support in various means to allow people in the ghetto to move out to the newer suburbs and the newer part of metropolitan areas. And that's really the balance. And in effect, the housing part of it, if you jump to the present day, uh, in terms of dispersal, allowing people choices, is still marginal in terms of suburban black Latino populations. And central cities have gone through a number of programs, I'm sort of proud to say, generated from the Model Cities program, that really are called a different name, adding a few new initiatives, but generally the same program, uh, or the concept of program, coordinate federal programs and, and uh, support grants 
in certain areas of central city that were considered the, the worst quality of housing, the worst quality of jobs, income. And so that really is a strain on community development and on the housing. The issue was how fast could we get FHA in effect to change its suburban focus to be a more balanced housing insurance agency that would also ensure people who want to leave the, the ghetto areas and want to move into the suburbs. The way we also missed an opportunity is that minorities, low income minorities could not share in the increased value of housing. So they could not share in the equity that I made to send my kids to college. When I bought a house, it increased in value. I, when I sold it, I had enough money to send my children to college. Blacks could not do that in the numbers proportional uh, to whites or percentages. So that, was, that whole effort of, in effect, place versus people, failure to solve integration issues, I think has sort of blurred HUD, HUD's history since its inception. Now, there were several issues that also weren't factored into HUD's expectations, which were noble expectations by noble people. That is, what role does the economy play? And we ran into a situation where noble objectives, high sites uh, objectives, ran up against the Vietnam War and guns or butter. And so, uh, in effect, Johnson tried to do both, guns and butter, and the domestic programs were often short circuit in terms of the total money involved. We had a lot of programs grow. We had like 400 categorical programs throughout the federal government in grow in the 60s and early 70s. But the guns versus butter issue, the general economic issues, inflation, recession, were not built into that model. It was, and that was a problem because everyone thought we would go like this, go up in performance, but then we had to, there were, for example, there was no Vietnam, you know, dividend. Everyone said, if we only got out of Vietnam, we would get more money. That didn't happen. We had recessions, we had inflation, uh, and we had to accommodate that, and HUD programs then went up and down as to production or as to funds if it was a community neighborhood revitalization effort. The concept that was pervasive in the community development side that just didn't work was HUD as the lead agency. In other words, in the Model Cities program, in the Neighborhood Choice program that came out of the uh, Obama administration, um, the, so it's the same of coordinating federal programs and social service programs and housing programs. Um, HUD was a young agency with a constituency that wasn't as powerful as HEW or now HHS. <laughs> Excuse me, and um, and 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 its constituency, plus the fact that we had all these categorical programs with their own guidelines and their own agency saying, "Hey, that's my program. I'm not going to give it up to HUD. Why should I?" So, in effect, HUD's effort to try to bring in other agency programs as the lead agency. Um, in effect, was marginalized. Again, they had some successes. At, and actually, some of those successes occurred during the Nixon administration when there were very good folks that were chosen for HEW at the time, Sidney Gardner, Bob Petroselli, and they were, they were able to work with HUD on some demonstrations on social services, but the overall concept of HUD as a lead agency just did not work as well as people wanted. And that was built into the community development programs from the outset. Um, so you had failure to integrate, you had 
failure to accommodate guns and butter, and that's these are not HUD problems, these are contextual problems. Then you had internally at HUD, you had the problem of HUD's inability to function as a lead agency. On the other hand, Model Cities in a strange way has survived till the present time. People still borrow the concept and still turn to HUD as the lead agency and still gain the same results, that is marginal cooperation by other federal agencies. The whole issue, another issue that is pervasive at HUD, uh, is an internal one, whether we focus on people and choice or we focus on spatial revitalization, neighborhoods and communities. We've never been able to lick that uh, or to reconcile the two. In other words, HUD tried to move towards vouchers at one point in time. They had the Section 8 program, but they too were almost place based. They were run by the Public Housing Authority. Most of those sort of income oriented programs were run by Public PHA, and they were related to existing housing or new housing in specific places. But we never had a real income support program that would have given households the choice to make themselves as to where they moved. And if the economists are right, by having income, you would have increased housing production if they made those choices. But they could move anywhere if they had income support. Now, in a strange way, again, the Nixon administration almost um, uh, had a guaranteed annual income. It was called the Family Allowance Plan. The Family Allowance Plan would have set a minimum income, I think, at the time of 1970 of about $3,000, but it moved up if you had more people in your family. So each kid, each, until it was, uh, I think, four or 5,000 at the time. What happened is the, you know, the, that the, I guess, Democrats um, did not want to uh, give Nixon the credit for a guaranteed annual income, but, and so they outbid it. And when he proposed 3,000, I believe they proposed 7,000. And that partisan, um, you know, um, that partisan conflict killed the family allowance plan. I happened to be at a party the night it was voted on at Jack Conway's house. Jack was the uh, deputy to Robert Weaver in HHFA and a famous labor union leader. And people came back from monitoring the Congress. I believe that may have been earlier. I'm sorry, that may be something else. But this was in 1970, where we could have had the genesis of a family allowance plan. Pat Moynihan also played another role in my own life and had me do some other work. He had me come back to Washington. I was a consultant through the Johnson Wood era on the Model Cities program. Um, I had done a, a report on Oakland, California called for the Federal Executive Board. And it was on the impact of federal programs in Oakland. And what it showed is that we don't know how much money went into Oakland and we really didn't have a handle on their impact. Well, Pat Moynihan, who was a reader of my books and we became friendly, uh, saw the report and he wrote, he wrote out of the clear blue, which I was surprised at, asking every cabinet member in the Nixon administration to read that report. So then Floyd Hyde, who was then assistant secretary, replacing Ralph, you know, Taylor, and they were friends and they were not, there was no partisan divide. Uh, he, uh, I went back and served as an advisor to Floyd for a year. And I did two, two studies then, one for Floyd, on the simplification of federal programs. It was the only study on simplification that took 500 pages. And it showed you how difficult federal programs were to work with. And, you know, each one had their own guidelines, their own agency, their own uh, budgets, and their own guidelines.
Some said you could use them in cities, some said you could not. You had to fight all of those guidelines to come up with that comprehensive program that HUD wanted in central cities. I also was the staff, um, uh, Moynihan uh, created the Banfield Commission for the president, Nixon. The Banfield Commission was supposed to, in fact, I think, eliminate model cities. The president didn't like it. So, uh, but he, uh, Moynihan created this nonpartisan committee or commission. It had people like Lazarus on it, who was head of federated stores. It was a public private sector group. And there's one humorous anecdote that I will tell you, but then tell you how the report ended. Um, and Bernie Frieden, my co-author on the Marvel Cities book, was on the task force or the committee or commission. Uh, Pat Moynihan, we met at Harvard at the Urban Inst at the Urban Institute, I think it was called that, at uh, his old office, Moynihan's. And uh, he was late in coming in, and it was a cold September, October day. Pat Moynihan comes rushing in, had a scarf on, corduroy jacket, and he said, I want to tell you how much the president appreciates your being on this task force but I only have a minute to stay with you because I want to go to the Harvard-Yale game, the football game. So, uh, you know, it, the president thinks this is very important, but I got to leave, go to the Harvard football game. But, but that was Pat, and he was wonderful. Um, the Banfield report came out neutral on the Model Cities program, partially because there were some success stories out of Model Cities, and with some slight variations, the program could have been more successful, but on the other hand, there were problems like the lead agency that I told you about. Um, so we wrote a neutral report that Ed Banfield, I'm sure, edited, and we all were worried that it would come out that, that would, in effect, kill the Model Cities program before it had a chance to fully uh, evolve as a program, and then if it didn't work, you would eliminate it. So I, w I was kind of worried, and I called uh, Pat Moynihan's chief of staff, I think his name was John Price, uh, at the White House, and I said, John, the report is neutral. There are some good parts and the bad parts, but we're afraid that if it comes out, it won't um, it won't help you know, reform the model city program, but it might kill it. So we decided to change the title. And we said, model cities, a step towards the new federalism, which was Nixon's tag on his urban programs, the new federalism. Well, and John's argument and mine was that if it had a title on it, some of the media wouldn't even read it. They just used the title, title's positive. They would give the report a better contextual environment and sure enough the next day when the report came out headlines were model cities a step towards the new federalism so it did buy it two more years until it was killed and maybe it should have been killed but there were some interesting and that's why it continues to show up as the base of these new programs through every administration um, so the people versus place issue income versus community grants uh, were pervasive at HUD, and it still is pervasive at HUD. I think uh, whether or not you come out better in terms of housing if you give people money and they have their own choices. Um, the other thing that I know that George Romney always told me, I, well, during that year I was there, he used to give me a ride home, and he was a very gentle, wonderful, nice person, um, was that programs don't get, it, get time to mature. So every new administration comes in and the secretaries generally want to build their own agenda, so they criticize the previous administration and you don't get enough time to see what uh, th that program is or does or whether it was good or bad. And he complained about that often. But so the predictability of policy and program tenure, the longevity of policy and program tenure, if you look over the 
the life of HUD, you will see that it is implicit, like when the model cities is the base for some other program ideas, but there are oftentimes programs that last a few months and then, and then they want to kill them. Or when a new secretary comes in and if he is or she is very partisan, they will look at the previous secretary's programs and put constraints on them, redefine them, and you never get an honest evaluation of the successes or problems with those programs. And that raises the issue of HUD's ability to do research or in uh, Lindblom's, Charles Lindblom is a famous political scientist. He's now dead, I believe. And um, <coughs> he wrote a book called The Science of Muddling Through, where he justified muddling as a policy device, and he actually indicated how you should muddle. And it's always uh, struck me as a much better framework often when you're dealing with politics, partisanship, scarcity, changing economy. And for a good period of time, HUD was muddling through and research wasn't a primary, um, a primary um, you know, entity or function of HUD, even when it had to design or reform uh, its own programs. I think, you know, Romney, Lynn, uh, Carla Hills tried to build up the research function, and you know Donna Shalala did a wonderful job of building up PDNR, planning, development, and research. And she did make research an important part of HUD uh, research, both in terms of the program development and research in terms of what's going to happen in the future given different program alternatives or policy alternatives. The problem is, again, you had a change of administrations then, uh, and the research function went up and down. Sometimes you had it, sometimes you didn't. And I would say on summary that of the research function is that HUD was, HUD's development of policy and program initiatives were subject to papers by academics and internally, but that there was a lot of intuition muddling through partisanship, but they came out with a, a wonderful matrix almost of the different issues that we still have to face it as a country in terms of people and place, and even places in place, whether it's suburbs or central city. And how do we, uh, how do we expend limited amounts of funds? Um, so the research function, again, was a problem. The tightening of funds, HUD wanted as its community development functions to target funds to the worst cities, not the worst cities, the worst in their problems. Uh, so there was a whole industry built around, uh, you know, distressed city indices. So you had the, the 50 worst cities, the 30 worst cities, the 20, and you had a whole industry. And the issue, um, and, and, and had wanted to target these, uh, their programs, their community development programs, and, um, and other agency programs to these worst areas. That began in model cities, but also it stayed on as long as categorical programs were in existence, and we'll come to the CTBG program in a minute, um, but it was difficult to target. Those who were not rewarded with federal programs were mad. So mayors in suburbia uh, got angry, um, and when they weren't getting their what they thought was their fair share of federal programs, HUD was a central city agency in effect. Whereas the when you had a Republican administration, they were essentially a suburban agency. Uh, HUD had a minority constituency. Republicans had mostly a white constituency at that point in time. So targeting as a sustained construct, given the inability for HUD to play a lead agency role, um, in effect, never really occurred. 
And uh, Bob Embry, who I was a colleague of at HUD, he was the assistant secretary and I was the, you know, I was the un undercutter and the, you know, his deputy. Um, we realized that it would be difficult to do targeting, but we aim to provide the administration with what we call the first urban, urban policy focused on central cities. And in effect, that relied on targeting. And um, again, we had the same problems. I, for Bob, I convened a interagency task force to see, to try to negotiate with other agencies, a flow of funds to central city. And we had some successes, but we also weren't able to do it in a big way. And so both Bob and I, I think in retrospect, think that while targeting was a legitimate objective and an important objective, that in effect, it was an objective that couldn't be achieved um, at the present time, easily. Um, again, HUD's constituency was not as powerful as other agencies' constituency. And also targeting to central cities seemed to conflict with the housing objective. I mean, if, if you target to central cities and you revitalize in place, you are, and you don't put the money into sort of income support or income assistance programs, you are saying, let's build up the ghetto areas uh, and uh, not provide the type of income support that might uh, allow people to make choices be as to where they want to live. It, it was a difficult problem, but it was a pervasive problem. The Community Development Block Grant Program, I'm going back and forth a bit to try to cut and fill. The Community Development Block Grant Program was a Nixon program. It was as part of his special revenue sharing effort. Uh, and, excuse me. And um, he, uh, in construct, what, what the administration said and what the governor said, Romney, Lynn, Hills, uh, was that categorical programs had to be reformed and the only way you could reform them is to put them into a block grant. And that, for cities, that became the community development block grant program. The problem with community development block grant program is that the formula they used dispersed the funds. So while central cities got more in terms of categorical programs, they often got less in terms of the formula governing the distribution of the CDBG program. And that was a problem. It was a problem in the sense that if the CDBG program was not mainly focused on physical space and buildings and infrastructure, but focused also on income, support, maybe it could have reconciled because you would have in effect had more flexibility to revitalize central cities or the, the poor parts of central cities um, and also give people a choice to move to suburbs, but it wasn't. So HUD and uh, in effect in the CDBG program got more flexibility, but relatively less money in terms of the growth of what would have occurred on categorical programs. But something had to be done with categorical programs other, because we had, again, around 400 at that point in time. And they were just, uh, I wish I had time to tell you another uh, funny story. Maybe I will, and then you'll tell me you can cut it later on. But I was in Honolulu doing the model, helping on the Model Cities program at a citizens group. And I thought I knew the inventory. So I went up to the blackboard and I made sure they were Hawaiians in the audience, American Samoans. And I said, you give me an objective that you want to happen in the model cities area and I'll give you a federal program. I made clear you that you often couldn't get these programs, but there was a program and if you worked hard enough, you might. So we had about like 50 to 100 programs on the board, the 701 for planning and 
236 for multi-family uh, housing and 235 for ownership. And then, so after about an hour of doing this, one American Samoan raised his hand and said, do you have a program for cockfighting? And, you know, cockfighting is, is, is illegal under our culture, but it isn't in American Samoa, and they had immigrated to Honolulu. Or, and I had to say, no, we don't. And perhaps that's the trouble with categorical programs. We can't tailor them to the needs of the community because they have these rigid guidelines. Now, I got to tell you another story that has the same ending. And um, I was doing work on the Bed Stuyvesant project for Senator Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Jack Javits. And I was out in Bed Stuyvesant one night at a citizen meeting, and I was taking them through the model city's planning criteria, which were quite intense. You had to spend a year developing your problem analysis and your goals and your strategy, all with citizens uh, and involvement. And I thought I was doing a wonderful job. Um, then one woman in the back of the room got up and said, Mr. Kaplan, I don't care about strategic planning. I got rats in my house, killed them. And that, again, does call into question comprehensive planning versus you know, focused planning on people's needs. And that's when I started to think about the book I wrote on the irrelevance of city planning in the 60s. Um, and, you know, that we often think in, intellectually of what we believe is a rational planning process when some, and we build that into our programs when people need help and they need simple help. I have rats, killed them. That stayed in my mind for a long period of time. Just going on a couple of more points. I said targeting was was hard to do. Um, categorical programs were hard to work with. Um, the you know the um, that we missed an opportunity on the family allowance plan. I tried to, because you you prodded me a bit, and I tried to sit back and think about how would you describe a theory of HUD evolution? And I looked at business theories again, and where they have, in the startup company, you're supposed to have the innovator, the entrepreneur as you go, and then the manager. The manager ma uh, manages either growth or decline, at, but depending on the period. But there's a theory of how startup companies develop. And I, I, short, I shorthanded or shortcut it, but that's the general theory. And then Arthur Schlesinger Sr. had a theory in the 50s that federal policy, it goes through periods of activism and then non-activism, activism and then management, activism and then management. So I try to say, how would I categorize HUD? And there's no ready theory availability because the, the politics of choosing secretaries and changing administrations, looking back and saying, hey, that program isn't good because I didn't define it, um, and starting out with new programs and then killing them without much research because a new administration comes in or a new secretary comes in. Um, you know, so I, I want to think about that more. I mean, can we explain HUD in the context of uh, any theoretical so we can predict what might happen? And I, I came out of this review that you mandated that I do and that I took consciously. I was afraid of Jewish guilt, um, which is very, very tough. Let me summarize. Um, I have some heroes in my life, mentors. I think Robert Weaver and Bob Wood and Ralph Taylor did a superb job in a tough situation to build an agency. Larry Simons was, in, you know, the, that whole more Chusheim 
I think more his past, I'm not sure, but they were heroes. Bob had rem has remained until he died, a mentor of mine. I took a class from him at MIT, um, and uh, he probably, uh, along with Pat Moynihan, was responsible for my continuous work at HUD uh, through uh, Romney and, and, and uh, you know, uh, his tenure as secretary. There were good people at HUD throughout history. Some were very nonpartisan. Floyd Hyde and Ralph Taylor were friends. They wanted to try to make model cities work. They did everything to try to save it a little longer. And then if it had a bad valuation after that in terms of impact, they would have agreed to cut it. They made some changes along the way, um, in part because, I guess, of the evaluation that we were doing, that I was doing with my firm, uh, which was a longitudinal four-year evaluation of the Model Cities program from its inception in 22 cities. Um, so that's one thing. There were, there were no bad people. Uh, there were people that were more ideological, and it was harder to talk to them. But even in the Reagan administration, um, I got to tell you a funny story. When um, the Carter administration ended and I had to leave, the Reagan people called all of the senior people in saying that they wanted to do an exit interview. And I knew I couldn't stay with the Reagan administration, both because it wasn't didn't fit my objectives and who I was. But on the other hand, I would I love to go to these exit interviews. And it was a funny interview. They, they were good people. They were just trying to test my ideological purity. And it wasn't so pure. And 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 so, you know, I remained friends actually with the person I forget his name. But even in the Reagan administration, um they were, and and they had a secretary, um, Sam, uh, Samuel Pierce, I believe, um, who really was almost hidden. He wasn't very active. Um, he was a lawyer, I believe, although I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, but even then, the the assistant secretary for uh, community development was a woman who I've tried to find her name for this video, but I couldn't. She asked me if I would do Nicaragua housing policy. And that was a wonderful but nice and a nice request, and I did. So they gave me a grant to go to Nicaragua, which was uh, an interesting visit, and bring together the Sandinistas, the liberals, which were conservative, they called the Liberal Party, it was a conservative party, the labor unions, uh, and all the other major parties. And we met over a year, and we produced a housing policy that they agreed on for Nicaragua. Now, it's hard for me to trace its impact because the politics of Nicaragua were so unstable. Uh, but, oh, there was a heavy component of private sector involvement in that also in Nicaragua. And, um, but that, I mean, again, we both, she told me, I'm a Republican. I said, well, I'm a Democrat. She said, well, if you and I don't let our politics intervene, I'd love to have you do the study and the facilitation of the effort. I had started something called the Aspen Global Forums when I was a dean at the University of Colorado I got a grant from Peter Goldmark at the Rockefeller Foundation, who was a friend since Bobby Kennedy days, but I hope I got the grant because of the Aspen Forums. And he said, can you do something like Davos, which isn't as expensive? And so we did with Russia, um, Brazil on housing, Mexico on housing, and had World Bank representation, IMF representation. We also did Nicaragua. And then the last one I did before I came here was on Israel and Palestinians, where we had both at the table. I mean, I like to facilitate, and, and these were policy sessions. And um, so Peter liked that and said, can you do somewhat similar, uh, and gave us a grant to start into to continue the Aspen Forums. And then she knew about the Aspen Forums, the Assistant Secretary. 
and said, could you do something like that in Nicaragua? So I did. And it, and, and it, was, uh, it was interesting, but it also, you know, I can be very tough as in a policy sense, not tough, but, you know, insistent, I have my own views, but I also believe that there's a way to reach people. And here we had all these different people who had just come out of a war, uh, you know, uh, the Contras and the San Denises, and, and, and yet she wanted me to do the study. And, then, and, and we were able to make some steps forward. So again, partisanship was more prevalent in the Reagan administration in the, uh, and in the present administration uh, with Ben Carson at, at HUD. Uh, but there were ways that one could work with and bring, that you could drop partisanship because the people were damn good and they cared. They cared about housing and they cared about communities. So if you dropped your partisan at the door, it was, you could have a productive discussion. And there were some good people in the Bush administrations and in the Nixon. Romney was a gentle person, a nice person, and a bright person. And if he hadn't made that quote about being brainwashed in Vietnam, he might have been president. But um, he always had a blue sweater on, and he was fun to work with. And, and I think, um, and he, he trusted me with Floyd Hyde, and Floyd Hyde did too. So I think we made progress there. And um, our simplification study, I think, did lead to the constant, to, had some impact on the constant reform efforts to simplify categorical programs. Um, the, a, a second, well, I said smart, decent, and talented people, um, but HUD was n never real and still hasn't to uh, reconcile community versus people, income versus places. And that became a big issue um, in during the, there were several critical studies of HUD by outsiders who were arguing for income, more income support programs. Um, the, the, the targeting is unless you have um, a public support and you don't in the political sense is a very difficult thing for an agency to do, particularly an agency like HUD, which was in its embryonic stages and had a constituency that wasn't as powerful as other agencies. Uh, so targeting and the lead agency construct go together and neither of them work very well um and uh you know uh, secretaries do make a difference but we have this concept now that president trump has talked about is what, what the deep what is it the deep state or the deep the sort of bureaucrats that really control life in Washington. And uh, uh, I met a lot of bureaucrats and I was one of them when I was on staff. These people I found were very, they worked long hours. They cared about good government. They cared about people, Republican or Democrat. And the concept of the deep state or whatever I forget is a deep state, deep staff in, the, in every agency trying to frustrate the president. Yes, there was some recognition that secretaries only last four years, two years, six years, and staff have civil service protection. And so there were some staff that did challenge, but most secretaries welcomed that. I mean... I was at meetings with uh, Weaver, Wood, um, Romney, uh, once with Carla Hills. Um, they welcomed the staff, uh, not, not, uh, not going outside, but to, to internally risk a dialogue on something they didn't agree with. Um, and so uh, 
you know, I, I, I think that construct is, is such a, a fake construct. I, I, people used to call Washington a jungle. And then Holland Cleveland, a famous academic who later become president of the University of Hawaii, he wrote a piece that it really isn't a jungle. And I don't think it's a jungle. If you know how to network, if you know where that you're searching for people who are honest and can disagree with you, Washington works. And it, it doesn't work in a big bang way all the time. So you get incremental change. And I think HUD generally is a better agency, I would have to say pre-Secretary Carson, because I don't think Secretary Carson, he may be a wonderful surgeon, believes in HUD's mission. And so I don't think HUD is as vigorous now in trying to resolve the conflicts it has between people in place, or to either produce a lot of housing or to fund community development. But I, I think all of the rest of the secretaries, at least that I have dealt with in, in Republican or Democratic administration, have been pretty good. So that's sort of a summary. We're in incremental as whether well Galsworthy say the wheels of justice grind slowly, but they grind forevermore. I may have taken that uh, uh, one word or two missing. But I, I think that yeah, HUD is an important agency and we should reform, we should amend, we should change, we should evaluate, but it probably should stick around. And there are no easy solutions. Well, thank you so much, Marshall. You know, I think you've given us a great historical perspective. Thank you.